So, in the last video, I realized that I skipped over a lot of intuition behind the various ways we can think of what neural networks are doing. Which is why I'll take some time in this video to do exactly that. In this video, I sort of assume you already know generally what neural networks are. And if you don't, then my previous video could serve as a quick introduction. But the main concept that you need to know from my previous video is that Neural networks essentially represent a series of affine transformations, aka linear transformation followed by translation, and nonlinear transformations. But I never really gave intuition behind how exactly might these affine and nonlinear transformations give rise to such insane complexity. Let's start with a simple example. Let's say we have these two entangled spirals of different color and our goal is to essentially separate them using a neural network. This could be seen as drawing some extremely nonlinear boundary line that separates the two colors. Now, I could just make a neural network that looks like this, that takes as input the x and y coordinates of the dot, and outputs a value between 0 and 1, where a value of 0 means it's purple, otherwise it's red, and the neural network will easily reach an error of 0. But our purpose here is to visualize what the neural network might actually be doing. Let's make our neural network one layer for now. Here, our input of two dimensions, aka the x and y coordinates, is being mapped to a vector of eight dimensions, since it has eight neurons. But it's very hard to visualize eight dimensions. So let's bring down our number of neurons in the layer to only two. Now, our input of two dimensions is being mapped to an output of two dimensions. This is very easy to visualize. We can now just treat the two-dimensional vector that is output as x and y coordinates. Or in other words, given a dot here, the layer can be seen as just moving it to another place in this coordinate plane. More specifically, if we look at the new x coordinate as a neuron, then as we saw from the previous video, it's simply the weighted sum of the weights and values of the previous neurons. That weighted sum is then passed to some nonlinear function. And it's the same thing for the new y coordinate. Rearrange and we get the following. As we can see, this is basically the same thing as multiplying a 2 by 2 matrix with the previous coordinate vector passed to some nonlinearity. And this makes sense, because if you know a bit of linear algebra, then you'll know that a matrix multiplication fundamentally represents a linear transformation to vectors. It's also a helpful visualization to see what this transformation does to the entire space at once, as depicted from how it transforms the grid lines. Our choice for nonlinearity from now on will be the hyperbolic tangent, which is defined as followed. And as you can see, it squishes our input into a range of negative 1 to 1. Let's look at what happens to our space when we apply matrix multiplication followed by tan h. Here, 10h is being applied to both the x and y coordinates. In other words, it's applied element-wise to our coordinate vectors, which is why both the x and y coordinates are squished to a range of negative 1 to 1. Note that other nonlinearities also exist. And nowadays, you pretty much would always want to use the ReLU nonlinearity unless you have a specific reason not to. And I'll put sources in the description that give an idea to why that is. The only reason I'm using the tan h is because it looks nice. In practice, we also add a constant we call the bias along with the weighted sum. This represents a translation in our space. Here's a linear transformation followed by a translation.
Then we follow it by a tan h to get this. Note that a linear transformation followed by a translation is called an affine transformation, which is what we'll call it from now on. Going back to our spiral example, all we're saying here is that a neural network layer is an affine transformation followed by a nonlinearity. If we make sure all our layers are only two neurons wide, then we can show the neural network as simply a series of those transformations in 2D. So how would this look like for a fully trained neural network? Here's the code I used to build the neural network using PyTorch. And you don't need to understand the code, just that I used five fully connected layers, each mapping from two neurons to two other neurons, except for the last one. And that I used the tan H as my choice of nonlinearity. You can see that our network is stretching and morphing our input in such a way as to cleanly separate the two types of dots. At the end, once our dots are cleanly separated, we can simply draw a linear boundary separating the two classes. This is what the last layer is, which simply maps to a single number in this case. The last layer is just a linear classifier. This can be thought of as projecting our data into a line such that the red dots are as negative as they can be and the purple dots are as positive as they can be. And with a bit of hand waving, this can more intuitively be seen as drawing a line separating the two classes into two clean regions. To me, this is just beautiful. Behind all this complexity, this is the fundamental principle behind neural networks. Affine transformations followed by nonlinear transformations. Now, using just two neurons is actually a huge limitation to our neural network. In fact, there are some boundaries that our neural network simply won't be able to draw with just two neurons and a tan H activation, no matter how many layers we chain. Let's look at this example where we want to separate the inner dots from the outer dots. In the previous video, we used this nonlinear transformations that we specifically chose to separate the two dots. But now, let's try to see how our neural network of only two neurons per layer with a tan H activation will do as visualized by a sequence of transformations. Let's look at it from another perspective, where we view some of the layer's outputs in real time and then show how those outputs evolve as the model trains. As you can see, the model tries so hard to separate the two boundaries, but it just fails. Intuitively, you can think through what type of continuous morphing the model will have to do to separate the two colors, and that we simply can't separate the two regions. Well, unless we tear the space somehow, but neither the affine transformation nor the tan H can do that. Besides, that would cause discontinuity problems and make training tricky. But neural networks are universal approximators. So we already know that it can fit this boundary given enough neurons in one layer. Here, and this is really cool. By just adding one more neuron and thus changing the output spaces into three-dimensional spaces, we get the following. Once our model got access to the third dimension, i.e. three neurons per layer, it very quickly found a way to separate the two regions by allowing the space to bulge out into the third dimension, and then the two regions simply became separable by a plane in the middle. To me, this is super cool. This essentially demonstrates to us, intuitively, the utility of using more neurons per hidden layer.
i.e. increasing the dimensions of our hidden layers. But how does this translate to real life data sets though? I mean, we won't exactly get a data set of say 28 by 28 handwritten digits where the images will form a structured shape within the input space, right? Well, if you're willing to believe the manifold hypothesis, then this could be true. The manifold hypothesis says that many high dimensional data sets that occur in the real world actually lie along some low dimensional manifold inside that high dimensional space. To understand what a manifold is, here are a bunch of examples. Examples of one dimensional manifolds lying in a two dimensional space include a line or a circle. Two dimensional manifolds are also called surfaces, which include a plane, the outside surface of a sphere, a torus, etc. And just for the sake of completeness, a zero dimensional manifold is a dot. And just to repeat, the manifold hypothesis says that real world data sets actually form these manifolds. The goal of the neural network is to then stretch and morph and disentangle these manifolds such that we can finally separate them using hyperplanes in the final layer. I think a good way to end this video is to try to show this concept in a real world data set. Here, I'll try to visualize what a regular neural network would do on the MNIST datasets, which is a collection of 28 by 28 grayscale images of handwritten digits. Here, I'll use this very simple classic neural network, but I won't bottleneck it to only two or three neurons per layer. Instead, I'll use the following structure, but perform PCA on each layer's output to reduce the dimensions to three. You don't need to understand PCA, but it basically linearly projects the data to a lower dimension such that it maintains the maximum amount of variability or structure. Now let's see the neural network do its job. As you can see, by the final layers, the network already found a way to morph the space in such a way as to position the digits into their own clusters. Here, we also see that digits that are similar are placed closer to one another, which makes sense. Neural networks are really not that well understood theoretically, but it can still sometimes be useful to think about how and why this black box we call the neural network actually works. I'll end this video here, but there's really so much to explore about this topic, and if you're interested, I'll put links in the description about sources that I found interesting.